Welcome to Mom in Mind, a podcast about maternal mental health from conception, pregnancy, to birth and postpartum. Real stories from moms and family members who've made it from struggling to wellness, and interviews with experts and advocates who work for moms and families to get the help they need. We discuss very real struggles that can sometimes be hard to hear, but these are stories that need to be told so that moms and families can know that healing is possible. This podcast is meant to offer information and awareness and is not a replacement for treatment by a professional or professional training. Thank you for being with us today. Hey everybody, welcome back to Mom and Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. You know, as time goes along, I'm more and more interested in bringing in nuanced perspectives and in-depth looks at other ways that our experience in the world impacts our experience in becoming new parents and new mothers very specifically, in ways that we become new parents and new mothers. So I was particularly interested when I heard from our guests today, from Babo Mia, and their interest to come on and talk about what it's like for mothers who are deemed to be overweight or plus size or even obese to be pregnant and give birth and be in the postpartum period and the kinds of pressures that moms feel and potentially even discrimination and the myths that they are up against most of the time about what a mother who is deemed to be plus size is capable of and the misconceptions that often providers have about their capacity to birth. And so that's what we're going to talk about today in a little bit in depth into these ways that a mother's experience in relation to her body is impacted during this period of time and very specifically around issues related to fat phobia or a plus size label. We're going to hear from Bianca and Natasha of Babo Mia. Babo Mia is a training and mentorship organization for women in the maternal health field, including pregnancy and birth professionals, childbirth educators, and parenting specialists. They offer comprehensive skills, business support, and community care through an innovative online structure that spans a global market. They see their work as a very different culture from both the patriarchal boardroom model and the female-centric multi-level marketing industry. They offer opportunities for women to work from home while making an income for themselves and their families. They have developed inclusive, accessible trainings for women that provide the skills needed to grow and sustain a lucrative business while being able to do that in the comfort of their home. Babo Mia remains fiercely committed to their original mission that was developed in 2008 to connect women to their intrinsic value and power. I'm really excited to have this conversation with them, and I'm interested to hear your feedback, and I'm interested to hear your experience and your thoughts that come from this episode. So without further ado, here's Bianca and Natasha. Welcome, Bianca and Natasha. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for having us, Kat. We're so excited. (laughs) Thank you. So I'd love for you guys to just start off by telling us about the work that you do. Yeah, so Natasha and I have an interesting history. (laughs) We are based out of Toronto, and we started by setting up a clinic here that offered fertility, pregnancy, and parenting services, such as, you know, doula services, breastfeeding support, fitness. Natasha was actually moving with her husband to Vancouver in 2013. We started finding out that news. And so she lovingly supported his career move, and they moved out there. And so we had to make a major shift with our business from servicing families through their fertility, pregnancy, and parenting. And we moved our business online and continued the training that we used to do for practitioners and then exclusively moved so that we support pregnancy and parenting practitioners through continuing their education in our online training and support platforms that we offer. Okay, so all of what you offer is solely online. It is now, which was a really scary and big move for us to go from brick and mortar into the digital space. Yeah, I actually live back in Toronto now, and we continued on with that business model because we actually liked it so much. We were actually really surprised to feel like we got to know people better 
we spent more Mm -hmm. time talking to people our support would continue long after our training and all of that was possible because of the online platform so we kept it the way it was because we were enjoying it so much and it gave accessibility to a lot of our trainings to people who otherwise wouldn't have been able to have it should they live outside of a city or not be able to afford childcare or be able to travel for a weekend you know so um, we actually really love it and we get to serve women all over the world, which is so exciting from, you know, the Middle East, Australia, Europe. We've had students in Panama and the Philippines and, you know, it's unbelievable what we've got to interact with now. Right. That's really fantastic. And I can identify with that a little bit in terms of kind of having this reach through the podcast as well. It's it's an interesting platform to be able to reach people where they are. And it's just so accessible that you have everything online and it really kind of levels the playing field in terms of just as you said things that get in the way with travel or having to find child care I love that Mm -hmm. so part of what we're going to be talking about today and I'm really interested and we chatted about a couple of things that you guys could talk about and I was really intrigued to talk about fat phobia and specifically how perceived weight issues are affecting pregnant and postpartum moms and their experience so tell us a little bit about that yeah, I can get started. Usually when we talk about this topic, we, we're talking about plus-size pregnancy and the way that women who are plus-sized are treated as they move through their pregnancy, their birth, and their postpartum period. So a lot of women who you know find out they're pregnant and they go to their OB are automatically treated as high-risk scenarios. They're put into little categories that make them feel scared or anxious or even shamed for who they are. And as a result, they have higher risk births, they have less safe births, and really many of them have traumatic experiences because of this. So that's one of the big things we want to talk about is how we can navigate this and how we can take away some of the myths around plus size women and ensure or see that they have a better chance for a positive birth experience because they should have the same chance as every other body out there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I love to just hear your experience and what you've seen in terms of the myths and the discrimination and how it's affecting moms. Well, Natasha and I always laugh because unfortunately, the BMI is used widely globally. Mm -hmm. And that's the tool that decides what title or what label we're putting on women and their bodies. And it's so flawed. Like it's literally what is your height? What is your weight? Here's your number. And like it doesn't account for diet or exercise or like the strength of a body or their muscle mass or like there's so (laughs) many variables. You know, there's really unhealthy people with a low BMI just as there's really strong fit people. I mean, technically, Natasha falls in an obese category in her pregnancy, which is hilarious. Like Natasha is like pre and postnatal fitness expert and she eats amazing organic local home cooked meals and like she's an epitome of health yet she's given this label that if she didn't have that advocacy piece she would find that she you know falls through that high risk you're overweight here's your category this is what your birth's going to look like yeah absolutely Whoa. yeah and i find that just for myself that i would consider myself a healthy person i really do try to take care of myself and I'm in the obese category, but when I was quote unquote in the normal range, is that's kind of how the BMI is written. So when I was in the normal range, I was far less healthy. You know, I was over exercising, mm-hmm. under eating, I was being really bad to myself basically. So it's really Aww. interesting how these BMI plays out. And for any of you out there listening who don't know how the BMI works, the wording that the boxes use is the first thing that makes people feel bad about themselves when they go into the doctors so there's you know there's normal and the very next one is overweight and right after that is obese severely obese and extremely obese and you're labeled as that and talked about as that which I mean (laughs) doesn't feel good for anybody yeah Right. I mean, I guess it makes me wonder if healthcare practitioners are operating from actual science or if this has just been a myth that's perpetuated that women who are in one of these categories that's not normal actually has a worse birth outcome. 
It's a little bit of both, actually. So there are studies out there that show there is higher risk. So the further you travel along the BMI, like the higher your BMI, the higher the risk. But the risk Mm -hmm. is very minimal compared to how it's talked about. So Uh definitely women who are higher on the BMI scale are at higher risk for gestational diabetes or Mm -hmm. preeclampsia, a host of different things, but just a little bit. But when you talk to a healthcare provider, it's almost like an absolute Okay, Uh, here in the BMI scale, you're going to have a C-section, you're going to have gestational diabetes. It's really talked about like, if this, then that. Um, Wow. It really is not at all. Wow. So for the people who are listening, maybe for the moms who are listening who have had these experiences, but certainly for people who are trying to wrap their mind around what happens, can you offer any examples of what you've seen and heard about how these women are treated and then how that affected their well-being? Yeah, for sure. We can speak to that. So we are doulas as, you know, one of the many hats we wear. So we have the absolute pleasure of being present during the pregnancy as well as the actual birth for families having their babies. So we have had plus size women, you know, anywhere from obese to extremely obese and, you know, as the BMI would label them. And it's so interesting that we do a lot of work around, you know, self-advocacy and making sure you're asking all the questions And the number of women that have been just like thrust down a certain birth path. And even though in our prenatal sessions, we, you know, teach them what types of questions to ask their doctor so that they don't Mm -hmm. feel like, okay, I'm obese, therefore I'm getting this birth. And so to hear the experiences of clients that they go in and they, you know, advocate for themselves and then their doctor listens or seemingly listens and is like, yes, you know, we can get you a walking epidural, for example, which means you can have the epidural and its benefits, but you'll still be able to move and you'll be able to eat, you know, which is something that can be a concern. Like, how am I going to last 24 hours in labor without right. food? So they're like, yep. And, you know, you'll be able to eat and, you know, making going down their birth wish list and agreeing to them. And then when they come back to our sessions, unfortunately, both Natasha and I have this like, you know, I really hope that's the case for you, but we know what's going to happen once you get to the hospital. And then sure enough, they get to the hospital and they're like, but you promised me I could eat or you promised me I could move around or, you know, you said I could have these things on my wish list when ultimately they fall into exactly the path that we're really trying to support them from, you know, falling into, which creates a like you go into your birth feeling lied to and there's this feeling of distrust which starts its own shame spiral and doubt and like that's how they're starting their birth process and that's Mm -hmm. their introduction into parenting which can lead to after when we do these postpartum follow-ups women sharing that they felt like you know they're really happy that their baby you know that's what they always say like I'm happy I'm healthy and my baby's healthy and that we got through that okay and I'm feeling really disappointed about xyz like that these promises you know, weren't actually fulfilled as they were guaranteed to me. Wow, that's devastating. And that like you were describing, there's a certain amount of being made to feel less than already before the child is even out. And that's, you know, a huge problem that happens for a lot of moms anyways, who are dealing with the stress of any kind of perinatal stress, but certainly parenthood, pregnancy and postpartum and birth calls everything into question already. If you're going in with this level, I'm less than because I fit this category and I'm being treated so poorly. Wow. How is that affecting her? Yeah. And especially, I mean, we're thin obsessed as a culture in North America. I mean, we're in Canada, which we like to always think of like so much holier than now, like over the U.S., but we're (laughs) identical. (laughs) So we are thin obsessed. So already women who are going into their pregnancies as plus size women, I mean, they've had these microaggressions you know, as long as they haven't fit into what we describe as beautiful and normal and right. So Mm -hmm. their inner critic is like strong. Anything that happens with their healthcare provider is validating, you know, that inner critic, like we're just feeding into this already this shame spiral and this self doubt and unworthiness, which in pregnancy, it's not quite as bad because we don't have the same expectations of a woman's body in pregnancy. Like, you know, we have a little bit like you're eating for two and you know, you'll take care of this once the baby's out. And then the baby's born and we have this like massive pendulum switch where, you know, we went from it's fine, you're eating for two to now like 
your resources are at its lowest because you're tired and your hormones are sorting themselves out and you might have some postpartum anemia and like all the what's happening for you and a new baby or babies and now we're expecting them to jump right back into less than their pre-pregnancy weight if you already were overweight and we put so much value on that like we see that as a sign of a good mom is that you Mm -hmm. look thin and put together and well and it's just like this intensive mothering model which is so exhausting for new moms just is an expectation that's not reasonable absolutely well so in terms of outlining can you give me the top several myths that you've heard about overweight mothers it's all myths (laughs) um Uh uh but what i think the big problem is is just this idea that being fat is inherently unhealthy Mm -hmm. that because you're overweight you are going to have all of these medical issues when really you have just as good a chance as any to have the birth that you want you just need to have the correct or the most supportive group of people around you people who talk to you with respect instead of using shaming language and talking Mm -hmm. to you like everything that happens to you in your pregnancy is because you're overweight that's a big thing that happens all the time too is this idea that oh your hips are sore well that's because you're overweight you got gestational diabetes that's because you're overweight like everything becomes because you're overweight when really like any woman who's pregnant is gonna have (laughs) sore (laughs) hips and is a risk factor for gestational diabetes like that's something everybody can have right Um, so the biggest myth is that because you're overweight you're gonna have a high intervention birth when really that doesn't need to happen at all we've seen many women who go through for example in Canada we've got really great midwifery care so women who go through midwifery care and their weight is never an issue they're treated Mm -hmm. like every other person they're given the same tests as every other person and if there's markers for certain things then we treat it when it comes up we don't treat it because they're overweight or treat them more hyper vigilant because they're overweight The language used, we had a client, she was told that because she was overweight, her vagina would be too fat to have a vaginal birth. What? Yes. That's one that we privately (laughs) laugh about all the time because we just can't believe that was even said. But, you know, we're not the only person who's ever heard that either. Like, that's something that's heard. Um, This idea that there's going to be some sort of dystocia because someone is overweight, you know, and then booking cesareans and booking higher interventions birth because of that without playing a birth out is is something that's very typical and very seen a lot. I mean, that that's ludicrous. I can't even believe that somebody would say something like that to a woman. But as you guys were talking, that was a question in my mind of what is the link between you know, supposedly in the practitioner's eyes, this mother being overweight, and then that leading to a cesarean. So one clue is that this idea of having like a fat vagina, that's crazy. But what are the other things? There is an actual term for it. I I believe it's called, I would never say it, so I can't remember, but (laughs) I believe it's called fatty tissue dystocia. Okay. But there's no evidence to prove that that would be anything there's other things too so statistically women who are plus size might have a bit of a dystocia during their labor like things might slow down there's always talk about big babies when women are overweight so that's one like fear factor that people put into women's heads is like oh well you're gonna have a big baby because you're overweight so we need to schedule cesarean section two weeks early so the baby doesn't get too big like that's a very very common one when statistically, like, we should be looking at big babies if there is gestational diabetes, not just for right. any reason, right? So, yeah, so those are those are big factors there is the idea about having, like, your labor will stop because your body is, is too big and too unhealthy to push this baby out. Yeah, that's a common one, not uh, being strong enough not to being strong push enough. out your baby. Yeah, and not being athletic enough that's or crazy. whatever they're saying. And the idea that you're going to have a big baby because you're plus size. And the idea that you have a big baby so it won't be able to fit when we would never be able to know that before the birth happens. Wow. You know, what I'm hearing from you guys is that, and what makes perfect sense to me is that moms are just off the bat losing their decision-making power. They're losing their sense of agency in their own pregnancy and birth and potentially postpartum too. And just how much does that impact their mental wellness? 
it has a massive impact on our mental wellness. And I mean, there's the shame piece as well that you know, mm-hmm. complicates it. And with that loss of power, it's a time when we need to be empowering parents the most, right? Like the birth is one yeah. day, but we're sending them home with their children or child, depending on how many they had that day. Yeah. And it's so important that they feel really powerful and confident. And when you go in with potential trauma or disappointment around your birth, we're setting them up for, you know, like already that you'd be set up for higher risk for postpartum depression and you doubt yourself and you might not reach out to communities the same way because you just don't like think that you can do it right or, you know, we've taken that piece that's so important instead of sending them home like you're strong and you did this and you can do it and you're, you know, wonderful and feed your body and feed your soul and take care of your family which is what we should be doing in the postpartum period, which is already such a tumultuous time. Right. So then what do you guys do for mom? How do you talk with them about body positivity and help them have that sense of confidence, even in the face of maybe other practitioners doing the opposite? We're always and continually, regardless of a woman's eyes, talking about informed consent and making choices because we do know that women who go through their birth if their choices are stripped away from them if they're not feeling heard that can set people up for birth trauma and postpartum depression so we Mm want to make sure that they're able to go to their healthcare provider and talk about all the options they have that they're free to make the choices they want in their birth they're able to look at all the evidence the actual evidence and make choices and then move on to have a birth where they're in control. So that's such a big thing that we do. We talk with them about what questions to ask their healthcare provider and what to do if their healthcare provider just isn't listening and just isn't providing them with the ability to make choices and the choices that they want. You know, are their healthcare providers talking to them and saying these things to them like, well, you know, because you're obese, you're gonna have gestational diabetes, so let's plan for that. You know, are they talking in absolutes? Or are they talking Mm -hmm. like, you know, if this, then what can we do about that? How can we still make your birth exactly what you want? You know, are they talking in a way that is positive and opens the door for them to have the birth that they want? You know, are they open-minded to that? And, you know, what language they're using? Are they saying things like that feel shamey and feel bad and feel awful? You know, you never want to leave your doctor's appointment feeling disrespected or shameful or less than. So we always encourage that if those things are happening and you're not feeling listened to, that you do try to find somebody else to take care of you because there are definitely plus size friendly healthcare providers out there that are going to see you as a human being and someone that can give birth and someone who's strong and you want them to be by your side during the delivery. Wow, that's so important. And as just towards the end there, as you were talking about it, I was also kind of thinking that, you know, if there's a mom who's newly pregnant or even trying to get pregnant and who's already fitting into this other category of plus size or overweight or obese or however they've been, you know, named by healthcare practitioners, then they may be already having experience being kind of discriminated against probably, you know, in their life. And maybe are already going into a pregnancy, kind of worried about things that they've heard about moms who are plus size having births. And, you know, it makes me wonder about how much work you have to do to try and deconstruct all those things they've been fed and taught or told. Oh, yeah, it's a multi-layered, multifaceted issue that a woman would definitely need to create that community around her that will support her through with you know her mental wellness piece and feeling like the self-worth is there and reaching out to find out if her healthcare provider is going to continue to support that work that she'd be doing and a bunch of people that are going to validate the many successes through pregnancy rather than focusing on the fact that you know there might be a slightly higher risk of gestational diabetes or something like that so instead mm-hmm. like oh you're doing such a good job you know walking to work or oh your baby's got you know it's heartbeat now like you're doing such an amazing job look what your body's doing and creating that trust Mm -hmm. that they might have lost in their body especially like Ash and I started with that you know size like how we treat our bodies you know we yo-yo diet and we over exercise and we starve ourselves and we 
binge eat. Like we just do crazy things to our bodies to fit into a mold. So Mm -hmm. instead, like really celebrating what her body is doing because it's not the time to be losing weight, but it's the time that she can be making some healthier choices while doing that mindfulness work. So she, you know, has some more trust in what her body can do. Pregnancy is a really interesting time for most women where they, you know, regardless of what their lifestyle was before, they suddenly have an urgency to do better, regardless of what that looks like. So for many of us who have been yo-yo dieting or have been really trying to lose weight and, you know, all the things to fit into this mold, now we're thinking in a different light where it's like, you know, I want to eat really well, I want to eat a lot of nutrients, I want to take good care of myself and nourish my baby, which is how we should be thinking all the time. But in pregnancy, Mm -hmm. we actually feel that way. So it's a great Mm -hmm. time to make those changes and see ourselves and our body is doing really good things. So a lot of plus size women will actually start adopting healthier habits. Every woman will, will, Mm -hmm. but at this point, she might actually lose weight during her pregnancy, which is really interesting and see that the positive impact of having this mindfulness around exercise and eating, what an impact that can have on your body. Wow, that's fascinating. So it sounds like just overarching in general, you guys really use a wellness model and you are sort of fighting against the illness model that is so prevalent in most healthcare settings. It is. And it's so hard to do in maternal health because everyone's so scared or that, you know, you have a vested interest, obviously, in your child or children. So it's like, it's a really complicated one. And we have mm-hmm. so much trust in our healthcare providers, which I wish we could, but unfortunately, not painting all of them with the same brush. But there is a lot of, you know, bullying behavior and just a, a, an attitude in the maternal health field that is really disappointing that essentially our bodies can't do it. And there's a lot of, you know, higher interventions and the rate of interventions is like way higher than what it should be, according to the government oh, sure. bodies. Yeah. I bet. Mm -hmm. So in the work that you guys do in terms of you do a lot of training of people who go out and help these moms, what kind of trainings do you offer that I'm assuming include all of this amazing wisdom? Yeah, so we have two that we do a lot of work around body positivity. And the first one is our diverse family certification. And this would allow it's really anybody that works with families. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in maternal health. It could be, you know, a chiropractor, a massage therapist, a therapist, a ro- like really anybody that would make contact with families. And it does talk about empowerment and understanding. And a lot of people might come into that certification with biases around body size. And so it's for the practitioner to also be working through whatever they might have around mm-hmm. the diversity, which covers, you know, racial issues and sexuality and gender and, you know, a whole gamut all the isms really get get in, yeah. touched on. That's awesome. And so we do a lot of work around the body positivity there. And then we also talk about it in our maternal support practitioner training, which is our name for doula. <laughs> That's our doula training. That's our doula training. But yeah. it's a training that is 13 weeks, so it's very different than anything else that is on the market right now. And we do that work through fertility. So when we're talking about the preconception through pregnancy yeah. and the first four to five months, So it's another area that we talk about this work. I love that. And can you list the other programs that you offer? Yeah. So we've created a sleep educator certification, and that is really the art and science of sleep. So it is not a sleep training certification, but it's how to work with families around really great sleep hygiene, because we know the link of mental wellness is definitely very strong with those two things. We have a pre and postnatal fitness certification We have a breastfeeding educator certification and we have an eco baby certification. So that would support families working with, it would support practitioners who want to make sure that the choices their clients are making are both green and eco and, you know, good to their bodies and their babies as well as good to the planet. Oh, that's fantastic. So I will be sure to include all of that information in the show notes and where people can go over that a little bit more in depth and make sure to have places where people can connect with you guys and learn more about what you do. And these programs sound so valuable. And I just love how broad and inclusive and insightful it sounds like these programs are. 
thank um, you so much. We have a yeah. gift for you too, Kat, for you and your listeners. <laughs> awesome. Tell us about it. <laughs> we wanted to offer 20% off of any of our programs for your listeners, and they just would use the code Mom and Mind at their checkout, and that's all cap locks, no spaces, and spelling out the word and. So Mom and Mind, and that would get any of your listeners 20% off their programs. Oh, that's so exciting. I might check one out myself. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really fantastic. Thank you. That is so generous of you to offer. I really hope that people can take you up on that. And I would also love to wrap up with you in terms of just what supportive messages do you have for the moms who are listening, who are, you know, in this position of dealing with this discrimination and the myths around being a plus size mother? I would say just know that having a positive birth experience and a parenting experience is absolutely possible and the first thing you should be doing is making sure that the team around you is supportive of that so if you're in with a healthcare practitioner that has been making you feel bad about yourself or using shamey words then you know run don't walk find somebody (laughs) else Uh and and get yourself a doula (laughs) Uh, yes 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 I love doulas Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I really love this conversation. I feel like we could talk for hours about it. There's so much for people to know and understand. I really hope this is a good support to the moms who are listening and who are worried about all these myths that they've been told. And then also to the healthcare practitioners and mental health support people who are listening to this about really, really keeping this in mind when a mom is bringing this up or when you're concerned that she might be worried about her capacity as a mother just because of her weight. So I thank you so much. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Wow. Isn't that just such a necessary conversation? Like, why aren't we discussing these things all of the time? I really want to thank Bianca and Natasha from Babo Mia for coming on and offering their knowledge and perspective and support of women. And I want to reiterate that they have offered a gift to us, and that is a 20% discount to all of their programs that they offer online. And if you use the mom and mind code for that, you will get that 20% off. So it's M-O-M-A-N-D-M-I-N-D in all caps. And you can go to their website at www.bebomia.com to look over what they offer. Very specifically, their maternal support practitioner training discusses body positivity in pregnancy. And the registration is open right now. And their next course starts September 28th. Other places you can find them are on Facebook and Instagram at B-E-B-O-M-I-A-I-N-C, Babo Mia, Inc. And again, I will have all of this up for you in the show notes. So if you're interested, please go check out what they have to offer. I'm really interested to hear your feedback and what you think about this topic. And certainly if you have any personal stories that you would like to add to this discussion, come on over to the Mom and Mind Connection Facebook page where we will continue the discussion here just think this is such an essential part of our understanding of a mother's experience and you know even in with talking to them I could relate a little bit to the things that they were describing and kind of realizing in the moment oh my gosh those are some of the experiences that I had these are some of the ways that I felt about myself as a result of this cultural societal pressure to you know be thin and snap back So it was a very insightful and helpful conversation for me as well. I'd love to connect with you guys. Please come and find us or go to www.momandmind.com and find links to other platforms to share this message with everyone you think could benefit from it. All right, everybody, until next time. By joining us today, you are part of the growing community of people who are aware and concerned for mothers and families during this beautiful and sometimes very difficult time of life. If you or someone you know is having a hard time, help is available. You can feel better. Please look for resources for help at momandmind.com. Together, we can support moms and families so that no one has to deal with this alone. Thank you for listening and being a part of the Mom and Mind community.